everyone, Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I wanted to do this next presentation on valuing our time and what a midwife is worth and creating an accurate fee schedule. There are so many debates across the country of what to charge, what's fair, what's reasonable, or really understanding what is your overhead expenses. I think too many times midwives don't really understand the value of our time or accurately understand what we're worth. We work 30 hours, we work 60, 70, 80 hours. You should get paid double than if you're just working for another company doing a very similar job. So anytime there's a legal disclaimer at the beginning of my videos, it has to do with these are general information purposes. The intent is not to substitute legal advice. You and your local area have a unique situation, unique regulations. I want to give a high level overview, give examples, give scenarios to help get you to think about your unique situation. One midwife might be comfortable making 60,000 a year and another midwife might want to make 150 a year. One midwife's overhead cost is going to be very different than another midwife. So when we do this presentation, I'm giving you generalized averages across the country. The whole point of this presentation is so you can verbalize what is a fee schedule? Why are they so important? What are the weaknesses and strengths of a fee schedule? How do you accurately charge what you want to charge and rationalize it? What services are you going to offer? Because that will make a difference in your fee schedule. And just to really understand what each service costs in exchange for time and overhead expenses. Doing a birth prenatal visit labor support home visits has a very different time constraint per hour revenue value unit than an office visit, IUD insertion, a well woman exam. They all have different time overhead costs to them. And so the goal is to help you kind of estimate out it's easy, you have an office visit, you spend 15, 20 minutes prepping beforehand, you see you're in the office, you charge out for it, you make your note, you follow up on labs, and take you a couple hours for an office visit. Prenatal care has a very wide range of what time could be part of it, especially with the birth component. So it's really important we make accurate fee schedules and be respectful of us being human beings and what's realistic for us to do in an average week. So a fee schedule is literally just taking all of your services, your CPT codes, your ones that are insurance reimbursed and the ones that are non-covered services, every single service your office is going to offer to families, you want to have a charge recognized with that and that's your fee schedule. So with the CPT codes that has to do with insurance, if you're doing cash, you don't really need those. Those are insurance reimbursable codes. You could just, if you take care of the Amish Mennonites, you're still gonna have a fee schedule, but it's just gonna be a cash component. You say OB full care from very first prenatal visit all the way to six week postpartum is worth X amount of money. That code equivalent, if you're going to bill to insurance is 59400. So you just wanna have an understanding of fee schedules what those services mean and what you're going to get paid for them. So most of the insurance companies, if you're going to be going that direction, you could become in network, you could do out of network. They have a customary rate, an allowable amount. There's a national CMS guideline for Medicare for recommended code cost. There's the private insurance companies making their allowable amounts. Then there's your fee schedule. Sometimes you can negotiate, sometimes you can't. So if you're out of network, families make up for the difference of what the, the insurance companies feels is fair and allowable. If it's cash, it's easy. You don't have to worry so much about the insurance and the payers. It's what is the families, the market that you want to serve, what are they willing to pay? So the strengths of having a fee schedule, it gives you more stability in your practice. It gives you confidence of understanding transparency, looking at trends, your income and expenses. You can get a better picture of where are the profits coming in and where are you losing money and do I need to tweak that fee schedule? Do I need to stop offering that service? Do I need to refer out for it? You really, the strength of a fee schedule is to give you confidence. It's encouraging behavior, especially if you're giving your staff bonuses you have other midwives on your team, those revenue value units, those fee schedules, they have incentives behind them. 
they'll help you to get a desired impact. So if you mostly want to do OB services, you can figure out how many people risk out, how many you're billing for global maternity, how many you're just doing prenatal care, how many of the families you're doing newborn services. Those are all scheduled fees in your practice services. So you wanna make sure you're getting credit for every part of the service you're rendering. I see that often with midwives that do their own private practice versus midwives in the hospital setting. There's more services we offer out of hospital. The home visits are not customary, part of the global maternity, the newborn care, the prolonged labor support is typically part of that hospital fee with the nurse. So when we're doing a fee schedule, the strength of it is we want to make sure we're cap capturing every possible care that we're actually giving and we're giving ourselves as a business credit for it. Weaknesses of a fee schedule. The catch 22 when we're out of hospital birth and there is a lot more we're doing outside of the global maternity services. We do a lot of newborn care. Some insurance companies will recognize a midwife doing a newborn service as a provider type. Sometimes it's the location as a barrier. They'll recognize newborn care in the hospital in the office setting, but they may not recognize it in the home location. And so the weaknesses of a fee schedule is you have to know really, really well especially with the insurance side not just the code does that insurance company accept that code do they accept the midwife provider type with her credentials and do they accept the location the diagnosis that could possibly affiliate with it for example one-on-one -on -one labor support typically normal healthy labor you can't bill that code out to the insurance company but if there's a medical complication you need to do a newborn resuscitation there's a postpartum hemorrhage there's a rest of labor there's some non-reassuring heart tones now you understand i can bill those codes to the insurance company versus their non-covered service because there's a medical indication for it so that's the goods and bads of a fee schedule it's highly complex it's a little overwhelming when i do consults with midwives we really dive deep into the fee schedule because it's the most important part of your business planning if you do not accurately figure out your overhead figure out what services you're going to render if you say i'm going to do 10 births a month but you don't really calculate out the average time you're spending with the women the average labor you've got mostly first-time moms you're going to be working 80 100 hours a week or you're really going to be taking six ladies because it's not realistic for you to take 10 ladies and then that affects your fee schedule and your income expenses greatly so why should a midwife charge her value we have common conversations with midwives all over the country about we'll fight with each other almost that you charge too little you charge too much everybody else in the area charges three thousand dollars so i'm just going to charge three thousand dollars and i always challenge midwives and birth professionals to think your midwifery partner collaborating practice down the street is going to have a different overhead it's going to have a different educational background you may have malpractice and Insurance. they may not have malpractice you may want retirement benefits they may want more vacation time like every practice is different it always makes me worried when a community every single midwife charges the same thing because they're not really looking at their true overhead expenses in their individual situation and so it's really important when we do business planning and consulting with midwives we spend a lot of time accurately figuring out this fee schedule for them you want to make sure you're fair there's discriminatory law if you don't understand you can have multiple fee schedules but you have to have clear office protocols to explain when each client qualifies for your cash fee schedule your insurance fee schedule your low income fee schedule your religious affiliate fee schedule you can have multiple ones lots of healthcare systems have multiple fee schedules but you have to be fair and consistent of who qualifies for it and you can't discriminate offering one higher rate to one person and the other person may qualify for that lower fee schedule you have to be very careful so when we think of what we charge we want to not just think about our own exact time we have overhead regulations we have marketing we have benefits we have staff we have upkeep you want an emergency account you want to be able to ride the highs and lows of reimbursement especially if you're doing mostly insurance and mostly birth 
your risk out, you may project it's 20% of your families, they move, they risk out, but what if it's a month where half of them end up at the hospital? Most of your billable charges are during the birth for a global maternity. So if a lot of people risk out, you still have the same staff, you still have the same overhead, you have to make sure your fee schedule accurately compensates for those highs and lows. So if I know a midwifery practice is mostly OB, mostly insurance reimbursement, I have her budget more of an emergency account savings to help with the highs and lows. If they're more of a well woman clinic, they're more of out of hospital cash basis for the pregnancy aspects and the birth aspects, they don't need as much of a reserve to, to ride the highs and lows of unpredictability. So when you're looking at your charges, and we'll go in details in a little while, you want to list every single thing you're estimating for your overhead expenses that month. I'd rather you estimate high conservative in a year you'll have a better sense with your practice and I'd rather you have extra money in the account than you budgeted too low and you're taking a pay cut even though you worked your butt off. That's the last thing I want midwives to do. So there's many different services a midwife can offer and you wanna have a fee schedule accurately implementing every covered and non-covered service you offer. So if you do strictly prenatal care and you send them to the hospital for birth um, and you're never gonna do a birth, don't have a birth part of your fee schedule, but don't also offer it if a, if a family calls and talks to your receptionist, you need to have your whole staff very aware of what services you offer in your practice. You want to compensate for that on-call availability. When we talk to families and we talk about our services and our overhead and that global maternity and they say, well, why do you charge so much? Paying someone to be on-call and 24-7 available with you has a compensation to it. You can either budget it within your global maternity services or you can add an additional administration fee, an on-call fee, some sort of non-covered service. The big thing is you just can't be discriminatory. You can't charge one lady, but then the next lady you don't because she feels bad. You have to be consistent. If you're gonna have a non-covered service, it's explained in your financial agreement. This is what that reference is, you'll be fine. Labor support is a service, birth, if you have a birth center facility fee, postpartum care, newborn services, the first month of life, home visits. A lot of midwives don't recognize there's mileage, there's travel. I would charge a distance fee if they were more than 50 miles from our office because I had to pay and compensate fairly my staff to drive the extra distance. So you can either do your fee schedule multiple ways. You can look at your overhead expenses and do a flat salary for staff. You can break it up based on services to compensate them for time. That's part of your decision of how you want to structure your practice. If you're doing more office visits, if you're doing GYN surfaces, you're doing menopausal support, you're doing pelvic floor, you're doing primary care, weight loss, breastfeeding support, the list goes on and on of what midwives can offer to their families. And maybe you choose to have a family nurse practitioner come on your team, a woman's health nurse practitioner. There may be some services outside of your scope that they can offer. And so you just wanna make sure your CPT codes and your services rendering are everything that every practitioner within your office is going to be providing as a service. So tips for creating a fee schedule, you want to reinforce what are things I'm gonna to offer today. And if you think in six months to a year, there's something else you're gonna to wanna to offer, you want to add that into your budget, you want to add that into your analysis because it's a lot harder to compensate with, I'm gonna add more services, but I really don't know what I should charge for it. You wanna really get a good sense. I'm gonna do 30% GYN and I'm gonna do 70% OB. That's gonna affect your fee schedule very differently than if you decide to do all well woman care or if you decide to do all prenatal birth postpartum care. That will affect your fee charges, charges because each code has a different allotted amount of time and care involved. So when you look at your overhead business cost, I want you to pause this video and just think. I want you to think of every single thing you 
pay for, you're planning on paying for with your practice. We'll have an example of an Excel spreadsheet for you to reference of the different types. If you're a solo home birth practice, you're gonna have different overhead than a team-based birth center. A well woman office is gonna have additional equipment and supplies that the overhead expenses are gonna be different for each practice. So you wanna really look at your regulations, your accreditations, your administration cost, your malpractice insurance, the staff that you need to have, the benefits for your staff, the benefits for you. You need to compensate for every single thing that's going to cost you money within your practice. Your rent, your building, your supplies, your emergency account, marketing, having the great resources to go to. You want to have a budget for your lawyer, for your accountant, for your financial planner, your business consultant. Those are really important people, part of the team that you want to budget for at the beginning. And then having a good sense, it just depends if you go cash or insurance reimbursement. So I'm going to assume a good chunk of your families are insurance reimbursement just because so many clients really depend on their insurance to pay for their midwifery services. You're going to want to get a sense of who are the insurance payers in your area. For the codes that you're going to be offering as services, what do they reimburse? I made an Excel spreadsheet with my practice and I would say, okay, CPT code 59400. Blue Cross Blue Shield in network pays this, an Aetna pays this, United Healthcare, Medicaid, any of the, there's some local payers as well. But then I would decide, does it make sense for me to be in network and accept that in network allowed rate? Or should I stay out of network and either renegotiate with them after the claims are processed or have the families pay the difference? Nationally speaking, most midwifery practices that are doing the most successful are insurance and they bill out of network. There's very few that can be in network and still give good quality care because the insurance reimbursement is lower for being in network, but you're also basing it on a volume. You're expecting more people to go to you because now that with the Affordable Care Act, their insurance will cover 100%. So it's that balancing act being a midwifery practice where you don't wanna push assembly line fast, high quantity. You wanna give good quality. So Practices that tend to do well woman care and more of the GYN component, it makes financial sense for them to be in network. But the practices that tend to be home births and birth centers mostly do out of network with the insurance. And then you want to understand on top of their rules, because insurance companies are private companies, there's national guidelines of recommended payments, but that doesn't mean they're going to do that. So you really want to learn your insurance companies. Like I had with my spreadsheet, I'd learn, okay, 59400, this insurance company doesn't cover out of hospital births. This insurance company will cover a nurse midwife, but doesn't cover a certified professional midwife. So when I'm doing my budgets, I may not consider being a network because I want a team of nurse midwives and cert certified professional midwives. And while we're sharing call, it gets too complicated to know, well, if this person delivers with this payer, you have to do the delivery because of your provider type. You have to look at those things when you're determining your foundation, your staffing, your fee schedule. You need to know your insurance companies and what services they cover, what locations they cover, and what provider types they cover for those codes. Because I've had too many midwives over the years, they go in network and then they don't realize X, Y, Z. They don't realize that the rate for reimbursement is so terribly low because once you get in a contract, it's very difficult to get out. You need to determine what levels of fee schedules you want. If you want to just do simple and serve the Amish in your area and do a cash fee schedule, super easy. Once you start getting into those categories of having three, four fee schedules, you now have to figure out, well, how many of the ladies am I going to estimate I'm going to serve our insurance? How many are going to be low income? How many are going to be religious affiliation? I would have a low income part of my fee schedule, part of the clientele that I served, but I also had a cap of how many ladies a month I would take in that bracket. So I had it figured out that I would estimate 30% would be cash, 10-15% are low income, 10-15% are religious affiliation, and then most of my ladies were insurance. And that's part of doing that market analysis, 
figuring out who your ideal client is because your fee schedules are going to be dictated by not just what types of services you're going to be offering but who you're going to be serving. You want to make sure your fee schedule is competitive. If you're charging $6,000 and every other midwife in the area is charging $3,000, one of two things will happen. You either are not going to be that busy or you're going to be like the choice of last resort because all the other midwives are going to be picked first. The other component I like to think about is if you're going to charge a double, you have to show to your ideal clients, to the potential customers, you're going to give double value compared to the competitor. So it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're going to charge $6,000, but that includes double the value of what the person across the street is charging 3000 So if you're going to do newborn care, you're going to do the facility fee, you're going to do childbirth classes, you're going to do massage, you're going to do chiropractor, you're going to add this massive bundle to your package, then it, it doesn't look so bad. So we just, we have to make sure we're competitive. And if we are charging drastically more than our other midwife colleagues, we have to show that value really well in our marketing campaigns to the clients. And knowing what the families are willing to pay, you could have the most amazing package you put together. There's amazing bundled care. You get to see an herbalist, a naturopath. You get this class, you get this book, you get this resource. But maybe the family doesn't want all those things, or maybe they just can't afford it. Maybe the cap, the husband put it at, honey, you can have a home birth, but I, we've saved and budgeted for $3,000. If they didn't budget and save for $6,000 and they have an insurance plan that doesn't cover you, it does not matter how amazing your services are. You are outside of the budget of your ideal client's affordability. So you want to know your allowances. You want to know what Medicare is in the area. And please, please don't ever charge the Medicare allowable rates. I usually tell people to double or triple that amount if you want to make a simple estimation for your charges. So if an office visit, they say Medicare for that code charges a hundred, is willing to pay $100, you should probably be charging $250, $300. So Medicare is just a reference point. And that's one thing, if I have a struggling practice, we look at what they're getting reimbursed for insurance companies, we look at their fee schedule, and if there is certain codes, they're consistently getting paid by an insurance company 100% what they're charging, they're charging too little. It's an average of 60 to 70% that even a private insurance company will typically reimburse your fee schedule. Just because you're charging an amount and you put it in your budget doesn't mean that's the amount you're going to get paid. So we always look at those numbers. We look at figuring out those CPT codes. What's the insurance average reimbursement? I'm going to take X amount of Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm going to take X amount of Aetna. I'm going to have a good sense of my clients I'm going to serve and a better sense of what the revenue stream will be from those services. And just stressing, if there's anything with your fee schedule that the insurance company says we don't recognize that code, which a lot of times happens, I had it with a few like initial newborn exams at home, a lot of the insurance companies in our area just didn't even have that CPT code in their insurance reimbursement. So then I would do a different direction. Do you have anything equivalent in the system? If they didn't, I knew that charge with that insurance company was a non-covered service and was the family's responsibility out of pocket. So it's nice for you to really understand your charges, your codes you're going to offer, your overhead expenses, and review your fee schedule often. Having a bookkeeper, having an accountant, having real-time understanding of your income streams, your overhead expenses, you'll be able to see trends, you'll be able to see Maybe there's higher collections in certain situations and you can catch those trends proactively versus you dug yourself a hole and now you don't know how to get out of it. So definitely look at your fee schedules regularly and then once a year, adjust it. So say, okay, we're starting 2022, at least add in three to 5% for inflation. That's a minimum of what I want you to do for adjusting your fee schedule. But look, look at your overhead income, look at your overhead expenses. Is there any charges you estimated this supply was going to cost X amount and over the last year it doubled in cost? You need to account for those things in your business because what happens is if you don't and you're losing money, unfortunately many of the midwives have to take it out of their own wages, their own bonuses, their overhead expenses to themselves. So now they're working harder and harder and harder and they're making less and less money and they don't understand why. 
So we're going to talk step by step different ways to create your specific fee schedule. It's going to be customized to you. It's going to be your area. You may be serving a different population than another midwife in the area, your educational background, your malpractice, your supplies. You've got a birth center facility. They only have home births. Like there's so many variables that come into play when you're creating your fee schedule. So just like making a business plan, just like making a big project, you take it step by step. So you just want to take a good Excel spreadsheet and you take one side of it and you list all of your possible expenses. You do some research. What's the estimated cost per month? Or maybe your Doppler is $600, but you only have to buy one. Well, your Doppler is not going to last forever. So it should be wise to have like an equipment fund or an emergency account or something that you're putting to the side for when those larger big ticket items break or all of a sudden get dropped in the water and you thought it was water waterproof and it's not anymore. You don't want to all of a sudden be your emergency account is pulling from your direct income from the business. So setting a salary is always an interesting one with a business owner. Sometimes the midwives will base it on I just, this is what I need to live off of. I don't want a bunch of money. I love being a midwife. I'm going to be a midwife till I die. I need X amount of money to live off of every single month. And that's fine if that's what they want to do, but most midwives like to have an emergency account. They want some vacation. They want to save for retirement. They want to budget and grow additional funds. Each person's salary, I would say nationally when I talk to midwives, birth center salaries, if we set it up right, you can get between 100 and 120,000. Home birth practices tend to get a little bit less just because of that facility side. So home birth midwives tend to get more like a 90 to 110, but I've worked with very successful midwives that do make 130 to 180,000 doing home births, doing birth center, but they also work really, really hard. They take double the ladies compared to someone else. So I'm just estimating based on if you want to work 40 to 50 hours a week, you want an average salary, you want a good work life balance estimate around 100, 120,000 with your practice. If you're going to do more GYN, you can definitely put it on the higher end. And if you're going to do a lower volume home birth cash kind of practice, you're going to be on that lower end of the salary. And then just breaking it down, every single service you're going to offer in an average week, how many ladies do you feel like you're going to see? I broke down in, in a pregnancy, I would say, okay, I'm going to do an hour for an, an initial OB. I'm going to see her an average of 10 times during your pregnancy. I'm estimating I'm going to be with her for labor, postpartum recovery, that whole birth process average 10 hours and then the home visits the driving the visit three hours for each home visit driving back and forth and so i'd estimate 25 30 hours per code 59400 from the very first time to six weeks postpartum and then i would average that over the nine months an office visit is much easier to budget because you just prep for the visit you have a little administration paperwork, you see them, you do the follow-up checkup on the labs, you reschedule them, you order a prescription, you do the testing, maybe you just let them know their pap smear is good and they don't have to come back for a year. So it's a little easier with short procedure, well woman visits to estimate time than it is for the birth component. So just do the best you can based on your experience, based on averages, and just be realistic because you don't want to say the low end and then all of a sudden you have a bunch of first time moms and they all have three day labors. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to not have the revenue you were looking at. You're going to be working all the time and you're going to be frustrated. So when you make your estimated client numbers, estimated time that you're going to be spending with it, I I want you to be realistic. First time moms are going to be calling a bunch more. They're going to have longer time in labor. They're going to have more prenatal visits. They're going to have more questions. That's okay, but you just want a lot for that. So looking at, like when I talk about estimating a fee schedule, when we do it, we always talk about your goal fee schedule and a break even point fee schedule. So if you have 
$10,000 in overhead expenses, we need to make a minimum fee schedule that makes you at least $10,000 a year plus that, or $10,000 a month plus that cushion of an emergency account. So you should be looking at more 12, 13,000 a month. If you have your overhead expenses are 10, we need to figure out a minimum fee schedule and the services you're gonna offer in a month that makes your, your projected income 12, 13,000. So you want to, are you going to work in the office five days a week? Or are you going to work in the office two days a week? If you're doing more birth, I would expect you to work two to three days in the office. If you are doing mostly GYN, I expect you probably to be in the office more like four or five days a week. So you just have to look at your unique situation. You need to determine, are you going to have multiple fee schedules? Are you going to serve all cash? Are you going to serve a combination of different populations? They don't cover Medicaid in my area, but I really wanted to offer to low income families. So we created a policy based on X amount, your family family size, poverty level, we had a very objective reference point that if you qualified, this was the fee schedule, but that wasn't most of my population I served or my budget and my overhead expenses didn't make sense. So you just have to look at multiple levels and what type of patient you want to serve, what's your vision, what's your mission, how busy you want to be, what kind of overhead expenses you have. If you're going to do a good chunk of insurance, you want a budget for a biller, you want a budget for verification of benefits, more administration time, collecting insurance cards, following up on claims, following up on outstanding balances. Whenever there's insurance processing with your midwifery practice, budget in more administration overhead cost. And that's part of why you're going to get paid more and your fee schedule is more with insurance versus with cash. And then you just have to reinforce every single time someone fits criteria for a fee schedule, you have to have in writing with an office protocol who fits this fee schedule. If they don't have insurance, they don't want us to process the insurance, they fit the cash. They're, we're in network with Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, we have to process them as insurance fee schedule. They're part of Medicaid, they have low poverty level, they meet XYZ criteria, they get this fee schedule. They're one of our Amish wonderful community and we serve and we do home visits for all of them and it's this fee schedule. So you just have to have in writing because it can come down to a legal defense thing. If you have two friends that are seeing you and one's getting charged one rate, the other one's getting charged another rate, they could potentially sue you and say, well, I feel like you're discriminating. We fit the exact same criteria but you charged her $200 for the visit and I came and seen you for the exact same problem and you charged me $100 for that visit, you need to have an objectable, non-discriminatory defense to explain that process. And then just updating and assessing it regularly, it's not the fun part of a midwifery practice and you don't necessarily have to be the one that does it. You can hire an accountant, you can hire a bookkeeper, you can hire and put part of your budget, the people on the team for the things you do not want to do but they still just can't be ignored. They have to be part of your systems and processes. So we already talked about like just what's usual and customary. That's such a vague term. There's wide ranges and what every practice charges is going to be different because of each person's needs. The cost of living in your area, the state regulations, the insurance reimbursement, the malpractice may be different in your area. Um, getting access to supplies. To start a birth center in Florida may be a very different cost to start a birth center in New York because of the commercial overhead appraisal costs. So there's just there's such a wide range. So if we are doing a group conversation on Facebook and we're trying to learn from each other, I always stress, she's giving an example in Texas. Your fee schedule in New York is gonna look different because of X, Y, Z. So you just have to know your local area, do your due diligence, research things really well, get a good sense of what is the baseline, what are the standards, and does it make realistic sense for the type of practice I want to start? Can I make a profit? Can I break even? Am I going to lose money if I'm going to set up my fee schedule based on this direction? So you want to add up every single one of your expenses. You want to look at your insurance, your utilities, your phone, your car, your gas, your time, your schooling, your education. That has value to it. A lot of our midwives, we do loan repayment part of their business, part of their benefit package. You want some retirement, you want some health insurance, you want some vacation time. 
these things all need to be accounted for when you're adding up your expenses for your practice. I can't stress that enough because if you miss an overhead expense, it's going to come out of your paycheck because you are the business owner. So when you're setting your salary, you're setting your you can set your salary whatever you want, but you have to have realistic expectations. If you want to make $300,000 and you want to work 10 hours a week, I would tell you, you've got the wrong business structure. You've got the wrong setup. We need to do something different in time. You might be able to do that, but we need to have realistic expectations of the average fee schedules, what you want to make. And I think it is very reasonable to get between a hundred, dollars $120,000 a year with benefits from your practice, seeing five to seven home births a month. But that's just all breaking it down and seeing what's realistic for your area and how many hours. If you want to work 40 hours and you do not want to work 70, 80 hours a week, you're going to have to be realistic of what services you can offer in a week's amount of time. So when you break it all down, you want to determine if you're having staff on your team, are they going to be independent contractors? Are they going to be salaried? If they're part of your staff as an employee, you have to be very careful. If you're giving yourself medical benefits and you have other full-time staff, you have to offer it to every single person. So you have to be very careful if they're independent contractors and they truly fit that criteria, you don't have to stress about that discrimination of the benefits, the retirement, the pension, the loan reimbursement. If they're not full-time true employees, you can be the only full-time employee with your business and you could hire a bunch of part-time employees. So that's just something to think about when you're talking about salary, benefits, overhead expenses for your staff. Labor is the most expensive part. So if we can do a balancing act of being fairly compensating people so they'll stay around long term, but also valuing their skills, their knowledge and their expertise. And then just being realistic, how many ladies you can serve in a week, how much time it's going to take you. If you're a new graduate learning and needing to do more research and prepare for your visits and you've never ran a business before, it's going to take you more time to see ladies. If you're doing it with no medical assistant, you have to compensate for yourself to prep, to set up, to sterilize the instruments, to clean the room. You have to be realistic on your time constraints and what one person can do. So finding your break even point, finding your minimum fee schedule, it's looking at every single charge you could possibly do and then being estimated the best you can of what income will come in for a month and you want to play around with the numbers. That's why I like Excel spreadsheets because you can put in algorithms, you can tweak things a little bit if you're like, well, I'm going to see what the numbers look like if I charge an extra hundred dollars per OB care and we're seeing 70 ladies, what, what difference does it make in your budgets and numbers? So Excel spreadsheets are nice because you can play around. Okay, I would really like six weeks of vacation, but we can't make that work. This fee schedule I can't increase the cost because we won't have family seeing us. So something in our budget of overhead expenses needs to be tweaked. It needs to be changed a little bit and being realistic of what parts to cut the corners and what parts you can't. And this one is near and dear to my heart because you don't want burnout. My habit with my past practice was take more ladies, take more ladies. We're not making our numbers add up. We're not making our budget. I didn't look at the other direction. I didn't look at our tax deductions. I didn't look at negotiating insurance contracts. I didn't look at our overhead expenses to see what is necessary, what isn't necessary, what could I renegotiate. My innocent answer with my first practice was take more ladies. We need more money. We aren't making our profits. We're not making our overhead. That was the simple answer I looked at. And I think a lot of midwives do that. So I really challenge people to make an accurate fee schedule the best you can from the beginning and then have like a business consultant, have someone on your team that you can leverage that expertise. Find another amazing midwife in the community that has set up a practice structure how you want to be. She's profitable. She has a good work-life balance. She goes on vacation. She has her structure of her business set up how you want to be. Work out a mentorship with that midwife to learn from. So this is an example of a fee schedule and I will attach to the presentations and give you guys the official um, Excel spreadsheet and Word document so you can see it more clearly. But this is just an estimation of your expenses. So I put in there as a midwife, this is a solo home birth practice. Very straightforward, very simple. I didn't want to make it overcomplicated. 
I put it in there that she's mostly cash. She takes a few insurances. Um, she does a few well woman visit for repeat clients. She doesn't advertise it a lot. This is kind of a typical structure I see for a full time home birth midwife. Five births a month, a little bit of well woman OB care. So I want to show just based on a national average and giving a comparison, if you're giving yourself all your benefits, you're giving yourself health insurance, life insurance, disability, retirement, taking six weeks of vacation, because you want to compensate for a midwife that's going to cover your practice. It's so hard when I see midwives don't take clients for like two months just so they could have a, a, a month vacation. I would like to challenge you to work with a great collaborating midwife in the area and have budgeted that six weeks when you want to go on vacation whether it's one week scattered throughout the year you want to go do some mission work you have budgeted funds to compensate for that person replacing you and you're still getting paid for your vacation time so the vehicle you could do it by mileage you could do it based on just the business owning the vehicle so that's something you'd have to decide with your accountant and your specific practice needs um, but you want to compensate fairly for that if you're doing a lot of home births and a lot of home visits you're gonna have to have a higher budget for your vehicle expense than someone that mostly does a birth center and doesn't go to the home very often your office your birth center your commercial loan whatever that is I mean this is a lower cost to living place and it may be renting a thousand bucks for a 1500 square foot but if you've got 3,000 square foot you live in California you live in New York you may have a very different rent and overhead loan for your space estimated for a cell phone office supplies midwifery supplies are always tough so I try to estimate it based on the trends of what we've done in the past like for suturing supplies medications newborn examinations vitamin K replacing stuff here and there you want to just make an estimation and obviously if you take 10 ladies a month you're going to want to double that supply you want birth assistance there's a wide range of what birth assistants get paid i've seen birth assistants get paid 150 all the way up to 300 dollars so in our area it was between 150 to 200 and so you just have to look at your specific area i do encourage midwives even if you're a smaller home birth practice have an office manager have a receptionist that's cross-trained as a medical assistant cross-trained as a birth assistant cross-trained as a doula um, there's so many benefits being a smaller private practice to have your staff multiple roles within it'll improve the continuity of care your families will build a relationship with your receptionist and now she's going to be at their birth it's just that's part of that unique aspect that midwife free practices can offer marketing budgets can range greatly when you're a new practice you're going to obviously want a higher marketing budget than if you're well established and you've got a massive referral pool you're pulling from so maybe initially you're going to have a marketing budget with a great marketer just just to get on Facebook do your website maintain an email campaign do some simple flyers and brochures but if you want to grow big and grow fast you definitely need to budget more for your marketing side if you're gonna do insurance reimbursement you can do it yourself you can do it in-house but I strongly recommend you outsource that part it's highly complicated you don't want to mess up the claims the negotiating aspect the rules the regulations I do encourage you to find a billing service they typically charge six to nine percent commission to do your services but they're all very different so ask lots of questions you want to have a budget for a lawyer you may not talk to one very often especially in the beginning you're gonna ask about your fee schedules your contract tracks all these little things and then your le legal services may just be maintenance here and there hey I've got a customer complaint we've got a near miss how do I be proactive to protect myself and so that's the whole goal is I don't want midwives that are now they have a bad outcome and now they haven't budgeted, and it's gonna cost X amount for a lawyer it, it just it gets really hard when you're trying to play catch up versus you're being preventative the worst that would happen is you budget for a lawyer and you don't use that that becomes a budget for a bonus that becomes put in an emergency account I would rather have you have extra money coming in than all of a sudden you didn't allot for a potential service and you don't have the funds budgeted for it 
Accountants and bookkeepers are really important. Prices vary greatly. You just want to do a good detailed conversation. I like accountants that are strategic business planners, not just accountants that are tax filers for you. So it is really important you do some good interviewing and find out the expectations of their accounting and bookkeeping services. A business consultant, I'm very biased for that part because I think leveraging the experts, you could have a business mentor in your area you pay, you could have a consultant that really understands the ins and outs so you can learn from their mistakes, you can leverage, you can I, I promise you the return on investment of having these legal and these experts and these these people to learn from that are the best of the best in their fields is going to save you a lot of time and get your practice more of a stronger foundation. Financial planners are awesome. I tell people they get paid on the back end with your retirement planning, with your insurance, they get commissions for the products that they set up for you. So it's not an hourly rate. You're not getting like a lawyer and an accountant a 15 minute increment and getting charged for their time. So pick your financial planner's brain all the time. Ask them lots of questions, set up lots of meetings. They are gonna be a huge part of your personal and business planning team. You want to budget for landscaping, whether it's flowers, whether it's mowing, whether it's snow. I have too many midwives that are like, oh, it's just nice exercise. I will do it. Those are that mentality that maybe it rained a bunch and now you're doing it every three days and you just had a bunch of bursts. This is what causes burnout. Your time is too valuable to be mowing a lawn. Your time is too valuable to be learning how to do SEO and marketing and branding and learning how to make the best website. Because there's people out there that have a master's in marketing. They, ha they have the equipment. They could do it in a fraction of the time you can. Whenever you're looking at hiring somebody to be on your team or utilizing an expert in the community, you want to look at return on investment. You want to look at what am I paying them? What am I getting out of it? What is the cost of my time if I went and did that? A midwife should be budgeting her time at about 100 bucks an hour. So if you can hire a landscaper for 20 bucks an hour, you've just saved your time and you could hire five hours of a landscaper for you doing it in one hour. Business liability insurance and malpractice insurance. Insurances are so important to budget within a practice. I hear often about malpractice, it's too expensive, I can't afford it. Insurance is about reducing risk. You may be one in a million that it happens to, but it, it, it crumbles everything. You lose your 15, 20 year midwifery practice because of one situation, one outcome. It makes you extremely vulnerable to not have these insurances for those rare situations. And a lot of times, some of these states and regulations, you can't even practice, you can't be a network, you can't even run your business without having them. Um, and I always challenge midwives, they don't meet with legal counsel, they don't meet with an estate planner, they don't meet with people to protect their things. If you don't have malpractice insurance and that's interpreted by the legal system as the standard of care, you could lose all your assets purely because you don't have that business bridge of veil protection anymore. So you just, insurance is so, so important. I can't stress enough. It's all about making accurate fee schedules. What are potential things you have to pay for? If that's a little more expensive, you need to cut something else in your budget or you need to adjust your fee schedule to fairly accurately represent your overhead expenses for the month. So workman's comp, most states are legally requiring if you have any full-time employees or part-time employees you have to be putting away workman's compensation for them so that's the other nice perk of if you are a director and you have all these independent contractors they pay their own taxes they pay their they you don't have all these extra things regulatory to worry about for employees so there's goods and bads of having employees versus independent contractors having an emergency account budgeted is so important with the highs and lows of unpredictability maybe an opportunity to buy an amazing building comes up maybe you want to add another staff member that's really awesome but you don't have the revenue to pay for her quite yet those emergency accounts are really handy in the expansion opportunities that come with your practice the worst thing that happens you put 10% away you hit the max level of comfort usually it's three to six months of overhead expenses for your practice you hit that level you don't have to save anymore you just give yourself a bonus but if you use that emergency account just like in your personal life you just slowly refill it back up 
So depending on if you own your building or not, having a maintenance cushion, um, whether it's a equipment maintenance, it's a building maintenance, it's not a bad idea just to have a little extra money to the side compensated. And so this part of the budget sample, I made it really simple. You could have 20, 30 different services listed. You could have lactation, you could have childbirth educators, you could have doula, you could have tub rentals, you could have supplies. But I wanted to make it really simple just to e explain the concept. And I think this is a lot of ways that midwives will do their practice structure for a full-time status. So five births a month, three of them cash, two of them insurance. Here and there, a well woman visit. That's like one a week. So with this budget, if you make it accurate, if your insurance reimbursement, it's, it's going to be higher than the cash level. If everybody in your area is charging $3,000 for home birth and then their insurance is more $4,500, you either have to show the difference in your value or you have to adjust your budget to get more competitive with your other midwifery practices. So those are just things to think about, but Here's just an example of things in a typical budget income and expense that I've seen with a home birth midwifery practice. So I wanted you guys to have a list of all the CPT codes that I could think of. And of course, they're always ever changing and your area may cover something that's not covered in another area. But I wanted you to have a good grounding of a sample fee schedule. Um, these are different CPT codes. Some are facility fee codes, some are professional fee codes, some are equipment fee codes. And then just think, you wanna list every potential service you might offer at your practice. If you're like, well, I don't imagine I'm going to put it in an IUD very often. Well, if somebody calls or one of your ladies postpartum wants it done, budget it in there, put it in there. You want to have it because you don't want to all of a sudden somebody wants a service that you think you might offer in the future, but you don't actually have part of your fee schedule. That makes it very, very difficult for the staff to communicate, for the biller to take care of it, those kind of things. So list every possible code and service you might offer, whether you anticipate it's going to be in the new, near future or not. So these are some more of the fee schedules. These are more or less common things that I've seen midwives do. You could do non-stress tests in your office. You could do wet mounts. You could do urinalysis. There's codes for lab draws. There's codes for the GBS swab. There's just there's codes for everything that you could do part of their care. It's just a matter of do you want to break it down that detailed like a lab draw is two bucks by the time you put in the code you process it doesn't make financial sense or just put that part of your budget for another service. So setting your fee schedule, it's customizing it to your area, knowing the type of clients you're going to serve, the type of services you're going to offer, the volume that you realistically can do in a week. There's a lot of different things to think about. And so I want you just to spend some time. This is something that's just like making a business plan. Your fee schedule is literally going to make or break your success and how your practice is going to do long term. You want to be transparent. You want to educate your staff really well. When that receptionist is talking to a potential new client and she calls and says, well, how much is it for home birth? You want to have a fee schedule easy, accessible. You want to have a script written down for your, your team to ask, okay, well, we've got different rates for different situations. Are you planning on cash? Are you planning on insurance? Do you fit XYZ criteria to fit our low income level? Are you affiliated with a religious organization? in the area like there's questions you can have your team ask to help narrow it down or you can just make it simple and say well those are great questions but there anything having to do with finances you either have to talk to our office manager or our biller let me see if one of them is available one moment please so there's different ways you can handle it I tend to like it if the billing questions go to one or two people within the practice because otherwise you see somebody and they say well my reception the receptionist told me it was gonna cost this much and maybe she looked at the wrong part that's a lot of responsibility to put all of your staff members on so having your biller or having your director be the point of contact for the financial questions really helps to streamline things. And then just being realistic. Do you want to, with your fee schedule, write off certain things? Do you want it to be non-covered? Do you want it to be bundled with something else? Those are all decisions you have to make with your practice specifically. 
And we already talked about it. You just, you don't want to discriminate. I can't stress that enough. There's a lot of legal ramifications. You are more than welcome to have one fee schedule or multiple fee schedules. So my cash was about 30%, exactly equivalent to my insurance fee schedule. It made it very simple. I'd say you pay the day of service, you got a 30% discount. Cash, simple. I didn't have to worry about claims. I didn't have to worry about overhead. I didn't have to worry about sending you a bill in the mail. It, it makes it simple. And so you just can make the decision what that rate would be, what the, the realistic expectations for your practice is. And just updating and keeping an eye on it closely with your bookkeeper, with your accountant. You want real time monthly updates for a while. Am I keeping on the trends of what I projected? Oh my gosh, I thought this was gonna cost this much and I had no idea now this supply is double the cost. I need to adjust my budgets, my tweaking. You don't wanna be blindsided when your accounts are dwindling and you had no idea you budgeted this amount, but it's really costing you a different amount. So in the beginning, have regular meetings with your lawyer, your accountant, your bookkeeper. Really keep that business foundation close in mind because what happens is we love serving these ladies, we love doing the care, but then we start realizing in the backdrops our our bank accounts look like crap. It's, it, it, it causes anxiety and stress because most midwives do not have that strong business sense. We love to take care of families, but at least if you aren't one that's good to keep up with your receipts, good to keep track of it all, hire a great bookkeeper from the beginning. So fee schedules are based on that best practices. You really want to just spend some time learning are you going to accept insurance what are the insurance payers look like there's a lot of research involved for your unique situation my goal with this presentation is to give you a good sense of it is possible to make an accurate fee schedule you just break things down one at a time you do some research what is the average rental rate in the area do some research what is a doppler cost what do cord clamps cost how often am i going to buy a supply it just takes time, but once you get systems, once you get flows, you set up how often you're gonna buy supplies, you've got policies in the backdrops. The goal is it runs itself once you get it going of the supplies, the insurance billing, you've got a good accurate reimbursement rate of what you're getting from families. It's gonna cause you so much peace of mind and the quality of the care you're gonna give is so much better. So these are a bunch of resources you can just look over and I'm more than happy to help anyone. I love doing consulting work with startup practices, improving practices and getting funding to start your practice, making a strong business plan and getting an accurate fee schedule are probably what I help most midwives with the most, just because that's the most important part of your foundation to success long-term with your practice.